All right, here we go. First Timothy for beginners, lesson number 10, uh, the care of widows. First Timothy 5, 1 to 16. So in the first uh, four chapters uh, of this uh, letter or book, uh, Paul has focused on leadership issues. He's uh, provided the objective of good leadership, which is first and foremost to preserve sound doctrine. And he's given a profile of the type of men who should fill the position of elders. He's talked about those who fill the position of deacons, ministers, and also uh, several verses uh, concerning the character of their wives. He's also provided encouragement to these people so that they will uh, continue in ministry. Uh, in chapter five, the apostle is going to deal with individual situations that may have been present in the church at that particular time. So a lot of these lessons here are applicable to similar situations that occur in the church in our day. So it's amazing, you know, 2000 years goes by and some of the specific things he's talking about in the church then, you know, can apply to us today. So there's wisdom for the ages. Um, attitude of the minister. Paul has encouraged Timothy not to let anyone look down on his youth in chapter four, verse 12, and to not be afraid to admonish and encourage the congregation. Don't get gun shy. Your job, it's your job certainly to encourage and to teach, but sometimes to admonish the church um, uh, when uh, things are happening in the church that are not okay. Uh, in verse one and two, he balances this instruction by reminding Timothy of the attitude he should have when encouraging others. So let's uh, pick up the text, chapter five, verse one, he says, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers. So younger men are not to be rough with the older men, but appeal to them as you would your father. You can correct an older man, but not as you do your peers. That hasn't changed. Well, in our society today, you know, anything goes, but basically that hasn't changed, that idea. Timothy is reminded that he must maintain respect even when uh, he has to admonish an older uh, person, an older brother or sister in the, in the Lord. Younger men also are not to be despised because they are younger, but they're treated as you would a younger brother. In verse two, he goes on and says, the older women as mothers and the younger women as sisters in all purity. So the same kind of balanced approach is to be used for older and younger women when it is necessary to admonish them and encourage them as well. In all purity does not here, uh, the reference is not to sexual purity. It refers to the way Timothy admonishes all groups of people, young and old, men and women are to be admonished how? In all purity, okay. his approach, his language, everything is pure, no uh, underhanded motivations, uh, no uh, looking down on anyone, whether it be for their age or their gender, everything done in all uh, purity. In other words, the admonishing must itself be pure, without anger, without pride, without violence, without disrespect, so that Timothy not open himself up to counter criticism by the way that he admonishes. This would cause his admonishment to have no effect. So if you correct somebody, but if you do it in the wrong way, well then you've lost the battle. Your correction has no uh, uh, moral basis, it has no credibility because you yourself are not acting as a mature Christian should. So at this time, uh, you know, at that time when this uh, letter was written, there were no social programs to assist the elderly or the sick, widows or orphans. Families uh, took care of their own or people became destitute or they were enslaved. Couldn't pay your bills, you, you got too old to do this, uh, yeah. It was especially difficult for women who became widows because opportunities for work or remarriage were not, were not great. Obviously the church family was not different and had the challenge of caring for widows among them at that time. 
So Paul gives instructions about this special area of the church's ministry. And if you remember correctly, in the book of Acts, one of the very first benevolent programs in the church, in the book of Acts, was what? It was the care of the widows. The Grecian widows felt that they were not being fairly treated in the daily distribution of food. But if you kind of step back a bit, uh, you know, uh, taking care of the widows was like one of the very first benevolent ministries that we read about in the church. And many years later, Paul is talking about it again because it's still an issue, it's still a problem, it's still a challenge uh, to the church a couple of decades in. Uh, so Paul gives uh, instructions about this special area of uh, the church's ministry. So let's uh, look at verse three and four, the general rule. He says, honor widows who are widows indeed, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. So the general rule, honor in the sense of respecting as genuine for the purpose of assisting those widows who are true widows. And who are the true widows? Well, women who through the loss of their husbands have been left alone, have been left in need, have been left vulnerable. The general uh, rule is that her family, her children, her grandchildren, other members of her family, should be the first line of care for her. Now doing this is a form of spiritual exercise that is pleading, pleasing to God and a show of love and gratitude to parents. Interesting that he said so that the parents or the grandparents get something out of the efforts that they've put in to raising uh, those children. Uh, verse five and six, he says, now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Amazing, Paul doesn't mince words at times, he's a little harsh there. Two kinds of widows he talks about. He clarifies which widows are deserving of such honor. The, women who, the, the woman, excuse me, who calls out to God for help and is faithful despite her desperate circumstances, that's one kind of widow. And the other, the woman who uses her freedom from marriage to go back to the world and abandon God. They're both widows, but they're not exactly in the same spiritual condition. So Paul says that there is a responsibility for the family and the church to help widows, but not all widows qualify. We read in verse seven and eight. Prescribe these things as well, so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So Timothy is to teach these two principles concerning widows and their families. First of all, widows themselves need to be careful to remain faithful to God, pure in their lives, relying on the Lord for his help. And families need to remember that to neglect to help their families in general and their own parents and children specifically deny the faith through this kind of neglect. You can't say I'm a faithful Christian and I'm all about it, but you, you ignore helping your, 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 your mother, your grandmother when they need help and you're the one that can be there to provide that help. So being a widow doesn't excuse you from being faithful. And being a faithful Christian means you care for your family members uh, in need. Now I, I understand we could have a discussion here on all the, uh, you know, all the exceptions to this rule, but these are the general rules. The, something that Paul is giving uh, to Timothy to at least guide him uh, in the types of disputes or the types of questions that the church might have concerning uh, widows. So this following section is difficult because we don't have a lot of background information to understand the context of what Paul is talking about. He's answering a question, he's taking care of a problem, but we don't know exactly how the problem was presented to him. It seems that the church in Ephesus had some sort of benevolence program in order to help widows. And Paul is giving instruction to help organize and direct this program. Now the problem occurs when we try to apply this passage to our modern context. 
where widows have government and company pensions and social programs and all kinds of things. Okay. So we need to remember, I, I taught you that some things in the Bible are eternal in nature. The resurrection, the truth of it, uh, baptism, the necessity of it, communion, the role of men, the role of women, you know, these things that are taught us in the Bible, they're eternal things. They, they, they never change from generation to generation. You know, we will always need to be baptized in order to respond to the gospel. It doesn't matter if we're all driving around in flying cars and you know, we're, we're heads without bodies because you know, everything is in our brain. Uh, when the moment comes to confess Christ, you'll have to go into the water. They're, they're eternal things, right? But then there are some things that are cultural in nature and discussed in the Bible. Uh, things which change from one period to the next because they are customs. The wearing of a veil, for example, what it meant then and what it means now is not the same thing. Foot washing, we've talked about that. It was a custom in those days. It's not a custom today, it's not necessary. Well, the system that they use to care for widows in the church is based on the society and the culture that they lived in. So we can take the principles and the lessons taught from their methods and adapt them to our 21st century context today. That's why I said before, the big picture. The big picture is children should be the first line of defense, if you wish, the first line of aid to their own parents. Well, that doesn't change. But today we have a lot, a lot of different resources to help us do that very thing. So we don't you know, wash feet to show welcome and hospitality and respect to our guests. You know, we, we, take, we take their coats, we offer them something to eat or drink, we greet them with a handshake or a hug, we meet them at the door, when we see them out, we see them all the way out, we don't just sit on the couch and say, all right, nice seeing you, you, know, you let yourself out, you know, that's not very polite. Okay. And so the same is true with care of widows by the church. It's different today than it was in that period, because our society is different, but we can apply the same principles. First, however, we need to examine their system, what they did. So let's read verse nine and 10. He says, a widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. Qualifications here, almost as, as, as stringent as be, being an elder. The, the demands, if you wish, the qualifications of this person. So Paul lays out the qualifications for a widow in the church who is to be put on the list now we don't know what the list is exactly, but many scholars believe that it was a benevolence list. Like in Acts chapter six, you know, the widows were on a certain list. Widows that the church helped on a regular basis. Some say this is where the practice of having nuns began, you know, in the Catholic church. But there's no support anywhere in scripture for this. In any event, there was a benevolence list and there was a question as to who should be on this list. And Paul clarifies this in his instructions to Timothy. That's why he's answering this. Obviously, there was a question. And probably the question was, who do you put on the widow's list? How do we, you know, how do we differentiate? We have many widows, should they all be on the list? Should we support anyone who's a widow? So Paul is sending back some information, okay? And basically he's saying, well, what are the qualifications or the, the requirements, let's put it that way. Well, she must be at least 60 years old. And 60 years old in those days was pretty old. I mean, uh, you know, today, you know, the, in those days, the, the, the expected life, uh, uh, the length of life in those days was like in the mid 50s. So someone went past the normal age all the way to being 60. You were pretty old if you were 60 in those days. Uh, the wife of one man. Well, there, imagine, here, here's the same thing that they were talking about for elders and deacons. You know, the, the husband of one wife, I mean, just, just reversed it here and said the wife of one man. 
doesn't mean only married once. She could have been widowed twice or divorced or remarried with her second husband who's dead. The point is the same here as it was in the instruction for the elders. She was a one man woman. She, in other words, she was faithful. She was faithful to her husband. Uh, a good reputation for doing good and serving others. Uh, that she brought up her own children and not abandoning this to other people. Uh, she was hospitable, especially to Christians. And uh, she has been benevolent herself towards others in distress. The one that the church is now going to support was herself an individual who supported others when she was younger and capable of doing that. In other words, not just a widow, but a widow who has been faithful and productive as a Christian. And, I, and I'd like to say that, you know, um, uh, a quick look at the widows in our church, they would certainly fit a lot of these qualifications here. Good women who have served the Lord for many years. Uh, verse 11 to uh, a long passage here, he says, but refuse to put younger widows on the list, for when they feel sensual desires in disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation, because they have set aside their previous pledge. At the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, taking, uh, talking about things not proper uh, to mention. Therefore, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach, for some have already turned aside to follow Satan. So in these verses, we may get some insight as to why Paul had to write about this subject in the first place. There may have been some women who claimed benevolence whose only qualification was they were widows, but were not living the Christian life. Paul is clear about who should not be put on this list for regular assistance. I mean, again, human nature hasn't changed, has it? 2,000 years later, a woman who's widowed all of a sudden sees an easy way to be supported without making any effort, just get on the list at the church and we're good to go. Imagine, do we think anything like that could happen today? Of course. That's why I'm saying, you know, the, these, this information helps us today, even in our situation. So who, who are the ones that you're not going to put on the list? Well, he, uh, under 60 years of age, imagine. Those who go back to worldly living and sexual immorality. Now the pledge that he talks about in verse 12 is not a promise to remarry. The pledge is to be faithful to Christ. Some younger widows are falling away from their original commitment to Christ by marrying pagans and espousing their religions. That's the faithfulness he's talking about. In addition to this, some do not remarry and live from benevolence, uh, are wasting their time as busybodies and gossips. They have, they're younger, they have some energy, they still could bear children but don't have any. So Paul then summarizes by saying he wants younger widows to uh, marry rather than to be placed on the benevolence list. Young widows on this list may not be motivated to marry, may be wasting their time or be drawn to sexual sin or marriage to non-Christians. So he advises them to remarry, raise families, care for their homes, and remain faithful to the, to the Lord. This type of life was noble and blessed by God and in all practical ways was a much better life, providing more opportunities for personal satisfaction and happiness than simply being on the list and living off the church, but having no, you know, no purpose, no, uh, no work to do, no, 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 no family. In verse 16, Paul writes, if any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. So Paul speaks to women who for some reason may themselves be responsible for women who are widows. You know, a single woman caring for a mom or a grandparent, uh, or a widowed woman with uh, older widows in her family dependent on her somehow, you know, Ruth and Naomi, that same scenario. So he repeats the same general principle if the widow in question is a true widow in need, 
you know, as described before. The younger widow needs to care for her and not put aside this responsibility because she herself may be widowed. The point is that some widows may have been financially okay and been supported by other family members. And Paul says that this woman cannot place one of her widowed parents in the care of the church using the excuse that she herself was a widow. Do you understand here? So one, woman A is a, is, a, is a widow, but she's been left money and property and you know, she's, she's, she's okay. And then her mother dies, okay? And she says, well, we're gonna put my mom on the church list. And Paul is saying, uh-uh, no. If you're able to support yourself, you're a widow, but you're able to support yourself and you, you know, your husband's taking care of you and this and that, you can't put your mom who's a widow on the list. You have to take care of her. She's your family. So that follows, you know, the, the, that follows the main principles laid out at the beginning. Family is first line of defense in order to take care of uh, the widows. Uh, I don't know who takes care of the dads here. They don't mention the dads here. <laughs> I don't know what, what happens to those guys. <laughs> All right, so in this way, the church can concentrate on those qualified uh, widows or those who are truly widows, truly in need, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, are counting on the church for help. The church is their only recourse in order to, to help. So what principles does this passage teach us for our day in the care of widows? So a couple of principles, hopefully, that we can kind of you know, put into today. I've mentioned it a couple of times. Number one, we are first and foremost responsible to help our parents and our families. And it's not just so much a money thing too. I mean, it's, it's a moral thing. We're the first line of defense. The commands to honor our mother and father and loving our neighbor is first seen in the way we care for our own parents and our own family. If we neglect to do this, how can we say we love our neighbor that we don't even know? If we can't take care of our mother, that we, who's our mother, we certainly can't claim to be someone who loves our neighbor that we barely know. So we're the first line of defense. Number two, the church is responsible to help those widows among its members who have no help elsewhere. You know, faithful Christian women who have served the Lord and continue to do so in old age should be able to receive help from the church when necessary and when the church is able. That's a, that's a biblical thing. Thankfully, thankfully, we live in a society that provides many resources to the elderly, but in the end, we're responsible when these are not available. And think about it a second. You think it's Satan? You think it's through Satan's influence that in our society, we have so many programs to help the poor and those who are uh, handicapped and those who are elderly and those who are sick and those who are poor? You think that's Satan's influence? Well, of course not. That's Christianity's influence on society. That society in general has a conscious uh, uh, responsibility for those who are uh, in need. Christianity introduced that idea to society. Uh, in the first century, if, if you had a baby that you didn't like, you know, what would you do with it? Well, you'd put it out in the field and just leave it, uh, leave it out there. That's it. You, you wouldn't kill it yourself. You just leave it out there to be eaten by animals or taken by someone else or whatever. That, that was the, that's the way you solve that problem. One of the things about the early church that was remarkable is that uh, uh, Christians in the, in, the, in the early church would find these children and this word would, would adopt them, would take them into their homes. And this was unheard of. You're taking a child that's not even your child and you're taking that child into your home. Yeah, why? <laughs> because it's a human being made in the image of God, that's why. And so all these good things that we see in society today, much of them have been, you know, have, have seeped into society from the Christian faith. So thankfully, in our society, in North American society, we have lots of good programs to help uh, those who are in, uh, in need. Uh, another um, another uh, idea 
marriage, family, the home, uh, this remains a woman's first priority. I'm getting in trouble now for saying this, but that's what he's saying. Of course, we have more opportunities for women to be educated and trained for careers in our society today. That's great, that's fine. But marriage and family and home has never been replaced by career in God's eyes, only in the world's eyes. In the world, you can just replace all of that with your career, but this was never God's plan. Now, on the other hand, it doesn't mean that a woman, the Bible teaches that a woman's not allowed to work, not at all. You can't, you can't use the Bible to make that point. Simply the idea, however, that a priority in a woman's mind is her home and her family. You know, it's more challenging for women today because they must balance careers and family but they find the right balance when marriage, family, and home are a priority and not merely kind of extra baggage for their pursuit of a career. And if you're not sure about that, ask your children. I've always said that to younger women. If you're not, if you're not sure where you're needed, if you're not sure where your first priority is, if you're not sure which is more important, your career or your home, you know, ask your children. They'll give you the answer to that question in a hurry. <laughs> and I've rarely, I've rarely met uh, women who are balancing you know, career, or work with home. I've never, I've never really met one that says, oh, I wish in some way I could just be home with my children. You know, I need to work or I, I want to use my skills and this and that, but there's always that idea that I, I, you know, if, if I had to do all the things, you know, I, I really would like to be able to spend more time with our children, more time in our, in our home. But it's a very difficult thing for uh, women in our age uh, today. So much pressure on them to perform and to succeed and to do all kinds of, all kinds of things. But the scripture uh, certainly supports uh, a woman's desire to manage her home and raise her children, uh, there's uh, absolutely no shame in doing only that. Unfortunately, in, in, in our society, if a woman chooses to do that, somehow she's failed. She gets the message you know, from, from, from you know, the media and entertainment and uh, academia, that if that's what she chooses to do with her life, somehow you know, she's not done the right thing. We know that that's not true. The scripture supports her 100% in wanting to fulfill that role. Okay, so we're going to stop here because that was kind of, like I say, he, he, he says different things here, so we're just going to stop right here uh, on this lesson and uh, we'll just keep on going. We've got just a couple of more before we finish First Timothy. <laughs>